we are honored that you're here today. You know, it's a nice, cool day today, isn't it, huh? It's incredible. Put a little pep in your step. So um, it's awesome. And uh, we're in this teaching series, uh, and it's about the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And a lot of times, you know, people have different opinions about that. There's actually a brand new movie out about the last book in the Bible that was written in A.D. 95. And what I want us to understand, it is one of the most encouraging books, uh, letters that is written in all of Scripture. It was written in A.D. 95 by a man named John, and it was a revelation that was given to him by a great revealer. And the revealer's name for the book is Jesus. It's not only about Jesus, it's also Jesus is the revealer and shows him what is yet to come for those of us who have believed in Christ Jesus. And so I'd like to say to you today that the book of Revelation is not a horror story, but it is a hope story, okay? It's incredible. It's written to the church. It's written to the people who have believed in the finished work of Christ on a cross and his resurrection. Today, we're going to talk about kind of the last part of the book. If you've been with us, you know that chapter 1, is about Jesus, and it's about him being a risen king, not no longer a suffering servant hanging on the cross. Chapters 2 and 3 is written to us, the church. It's written to seven different churches in Asia, but it's written to the church to encourage them that in this life, that you know what, to keep on keeping on because we are overcomers and the best is yet to come. Chapters 4 through about 19 is where Jesus deals with the enemy, and then we're going to look beyond that today. We're actually going to be in chapter 22, but it reminds us believers that the best is yet to come, okay? The best is yet to come. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that there is no, everybody say no, condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, God is for you, not against you. And so today we're going to be talking about this thing that is called the judgment seat of Christ. Now when you think about judgment, a lot of times you think about condemnation, don't you? But remember, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. So the judgment seat of Christ is more like a rewards ceremony, a rewards banquet to reward us for what we're going to have in all eternity. You know, the Bible says something amazing in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It says, God saved you by his grace. Grace being that you know what? You didn't do anything to earn it. It's just favor from God. Saved you by grace when you believed. When you believed in what? What Jesus has done on the cross and his resurrection. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift. Everybody say gift. What do you do with gifts? You, you, you open them up, don't you? And, and, and if you're smart and it's a great gift, you do what? You use it, right? You don't just sit it on a shelf. I mean, if you gave me a Ferrari, I'm not just going to park it in my garage, okay? I'm going to use that and maximize its potential. I'm going to drive fast, obviously where the law allows me to, okay? So, but, but the thing is, is you're going to maximize a gift. The Bible says you're a salvation believer because you have believed in what Jesus has done. You have a major gift. It's a gift. And it's not to be just put on a shelf to get to heaven. No, no, no. It's a gift that can be used right now to maximize your eternal potential. And it says this. It says this. It says it's not, salvation is not a reward, okay? It's not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Some of us are tired and worn out this weekend in our our religious journey because we're trying to work hard to please God 
So he'll let us in the kingdom of God. I want to declare to you today, if that is you, relax. Receive the gift. You don't have to work for it. It's already been done for you on a cross. Jesus did all the work for you to enter the kingdom and says, hey, by faith, would you receive my gift? And and so, you know what? You can relax. You don't have to keep wearing yourself out to try to make God happy so he'll let you in the kingdom. However, what I also want to say to you today, if you have received the gift, you need to get a little fire in your rear end because of what is yet to come. And, and, And I can tell you, man, salvation is a gift for us to use and maximize our eternal potential. And there's, there's a whole lot of understanding today about how to get to heaven and receive the free gift of salvation. But what happens is so many people don't know what all eternity holds. And can I tell you today, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and 21 that God is creating a brand spanking new heaven and a brand spanking new earth. Okay? And I like to say it this way, at some point in time, the Bible says the new Jerusalem is going to come down and heaven is going to merge with earth. And we're going to be beings, not just spiritual beings floating around with wings like many people interpret today, but we're going to be beings functioning in a kingdom for all eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. And based how you use the gift right here in October, 2014, while you're sucking air in your lungs and a heartbeat is beating in your chest, determines, determines everything you're going to receive and everything you're going to have responsibility over in that new heaven and that new earth. See, the Bible says it's impossible to please your creator without faith. And so you want to know if your faith is real What do you believe that God will do what he says he will do? And then do you act upon it as if you do believe it? And so I want to kind of really work through a lot of different scripture today. And I believe that God's word speaks for itself. So I'm going to be reading several different passages, but I believe this is what's going to happen to you today. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, remember there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But there is an appointed day where you will stand before Jesus And he is going to reward you for everything you've done in your Christian life to give you some amazing, amazing opportunity in all eternity. I'm not talking about 30 or 40 years here on planet Earth in retirement, okay? I'm talking about for all eternity. It is simply amazing. And God has so much in store for you and so much in store for me. There's a judgment that spoke about in Revelation chapter 21 And we've kind of worked through some of that already. And, you know, but the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 that after Jesus throws Satan into a deep, deep, fiery pit because he created that place for the enemy, the one that deceives so many, him, the false prophet, the Antichrist, will all be in that pit. And in Revelation 21, the Bible says that Those of us who have believed in in Christ Jesus are already with Jesus, ruling and reigning with him. And before he creates the new heavens and the new earth, he's going to throw the enemy in that fiery pit. And all of those who did not trust Christ, it's called the great white throne judgment. Those who have not believed, they're going to be raised from the dead. Raised from the dead. All those who have not believed are going to be raised from the dead. Raised from the dead, and then they're going to be assigned to this place apart from God, a real place called hell, forever and ever and ever and ever. And you see, the Bible indicates that for different levels of unbelief, different levels of sin in our life, there will be different levels of punishment in all eternity, different levels of separation, different levels of of, of, of basically um, not uh, of, of, of gnashing of teeth in this place called, called hell. So I like to say it this way. If people choose 
not to believe in the amazing grace of God and the amazing revelation of God, there is different levels for different devils. That's the great white throne judgment. He's going to raise all of those. You say, well, where are they now? They're in this place called Hades, okay? They're not in the final pit, what the Bible refers to as the second death, okay, that God prepared, not for people, hear me out, but for the demons and Satan and the enemy of God. But people choose to go there because they reject the goodness of their creator and what he has done for them. God did not create this place called hell for you. However, many of us will choose to reject the forgiveness that God offered on a cross, his free gift of salvation, and that's where we'll spend eternity. And I can tell you right now, it's not a little red dude with a pitchfork and a long tail just kind of stoking the fire, and you're going to be partying with your friends. No, it's a lonely place. It's a place that's separated forever and ever and ever. And I don't tell you that to, to frighten you. I tell you that to encourage you to believe in your creator. He is for you, not against you. And so that's the great white throne judgment. Now there's a judgment that happens, or like I would say, uh, uh, and we're going to read about it, a, a rewards banquet where Jesus is going to reward those who have believed, okay? And in your eternal destination, we're all going to have different assignments. And so I like to say it this way, there's different levels for different devils, but there's different ranks for different saints. Did you know you're a saint? The Bible refers to those who have believed in Jesus Christ as saints. So it's not only Saint Peter, it's Saint you, okay? Saint Johnny, Frida, whoever. If you believed in Jesus Christ, you're a saint. And so there's different ranks for different uh, uh, saints, okay? Revelation chapter 22, I'm going to start in verse 3, and this is what it says about those who, are in, who embrace Christ, and when he creates a new heaven and a new earth, this is what it says about that place. It is simply amazing. There will no longer be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and the Lamb, which is Jesus, will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face. You can't see God's face now, but you're going to see it then, okay? And his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and pay close attention, and they will reign forever and ever and ever. You know what that word reign means? I'm not talking about the stuff that falls out of the sky. That, that means, you know what, govern. And, and it's really what God created humans to do in the garden. Genesis chapter 1. That's what he told the first man and the first woman to do. It's to rule and reign the earth. Take care of the earth. And it wasn't like, like this work where it was exhausting and you had to get all this, you know, sleep and rest and you were tired and your muscles were sore. No, it was, it was to help God basically um, help God take care of all of his creation and basically look after the universe. But the Bible says that they were deceived by Satan in the form of a servant. And so the crown that God gave man and woman to really look after all of creation was basically, they basically took it and handed it over to the enemy. And the Bible today calls Satan the prince of the air, the prince of this earth, okay? And so, you know what, what we did as, as the human race is we handed our authority over to the enemy. And the Bible says that at that point in time, the earth was cursed, okay? And so the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that all creation, all creation groans for this amazing day that we're talking about right here. Why? Because he's going to make all things new. And all creation basically, you know, didn't deserve to be apart from God because of sin, but because mankind, the ruler, uh, handed it over to the enemy, now the enemy has made the earth a place that is defiled. So you want to know why wicked things happen, why the thorn bush sticks your finger when you're working the flower bed, why basically the snake strikes you and tries to kill you. It's because sin entered 
the earth. Okay? We handed over our authority to do what God had, had, had assigned us to do to the enemy. And this was a palatious place, man. Great provision. An incredible, incredible place. The Garden of Eden. And so if you want to kind of get a snapshot of what you're created to do, you should read Genesis 1 through about uh, 1 and 2, the first couple of chapters of the Bible. And then, you know what, you can go to the book of Revelation. It's kind of like the bookends of life to really help hold you up and remind you of what God has created you to do and be. And God has proven down through history that you know what? Not, not just the Bible, okay? For all you scholars, all you historians, okay? Just, just go study world history. And God has, has spoken in his word before a lot of that world history ever happened, and it has aligned, and it has been exactly like God says it would be. Over and over and over and over again, as he spoke through people called prophets, they predicted what would happen. And can I tell you something? History itself, forget the Bible, okay? History itself lines up that God will do what he says he will do. And so if God has already done the hundreds of things that he predicted and said he would do, why wouldn't you believe him in the book of Revelation to do exactly what he says he will do? And so believer, I've got good news for you today is this, this passage of Scripture in Revelation 22 is, is some of the most encouraging words that you can ever receive in all of your life. And it, it gives you a hope beyond our, our, just our human comprehension. Look what it says. Revelation chapter 22, I want to skip down to verse 12, and it says this. Look, Jesus says, I am coming soon. Pay close attention. Bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. If anybody ever tells you that your deeds in this life don't matter, you go to this scripture, Revelation 22, verse 12, and what it says is Jesus is coming, and my reward, he's bringing a reward with him to repay all people according to their deeds. According to their deeds. And chapters 2 and 3, he reminds the church, those who have believed, that you know what? He sees their deeds. He says it over and over and over and over and over again. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All your sin is forgiven. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are in the kingdom. But can I tell you something? If you don't understand that Jesus is coming, and based how you stewarded his mission, and his purpose for your life on earth, he says that he is going to reward you for that. In other words, we're going to have different, different assignments. I'm going to go talk about the rewards here in just a few minutes. But we're going to have different assignments. And it's based on how you managed things in this life will determine your management in that life. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want management. That's a headache. I get it. Okay? However... Must I say this to you today? It won't be that same thing. In other words, those, that, those assignments that God gives you, people won't be against you. They'll be with you, okay? Those assignments that God gives you won't be, won't be tiresome. They're going to be very, very rewarding, and it's going to be absolutely incredible. And Jesus says, based on how you manage your Christian life today, will determine the rewards you receive. In all eternity. Remember, clearly, salvation is a gift. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This isn't a condemning time. This is a reward time. And so, you know what? You're going to get in, and you're going to be happy, and it's going to be amazing. But I don't even know how to put in earthly words the reason you shouldn't just want to get in. Because by faith, we can't, we can't completely see it, but the Bible reveals to us what some of this is, and we're going to do our best today to encourage you to get on it like doggone it, okay, as a believer in Jesus Christ. Look what it says. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, basically who have believed in the finished work of Christ, wash their earth suits, so to say. 
It says this, they will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, and it's not referring to canines, okay? It's referring to actually people who kind of live in a manner that he would consider very, very unclean. He says the, the, the sorcerers, the sexual immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. Can I tell you something? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But once you do believe in the finished work of Christ Jesus, the Bible says the Spirit of God enters your life and begins to coach you to greatness. And you should want to put off the old self and put on the new self and run after life. And so what it's revealing to us here is this. If we would rather live by our own fleshly desires instead of the Spirit of God speaking to us, We might need to do a check because the truth is, is yes, we all mess up. All of our sin is forgiven, but there's a war that wages inside of your body, okay? And it's between your fleshly desires and the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is in you so you can become an overcomer. So you can say no and you can say yes, all right? And so if we would rather live the lie that the enemy gives us, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne, and I'm the bride and morning star. Pay close attention. The Spirit, the Spirit of God, and the bride, the bride being the church, the people of God, say a word, come. This is really important. This is kind of the last words in this, in this some some. Uh, uh, some degree in the book of Revelation. He says, let anyone, he wants to remind us, let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires to drink freely from the water of life. Can I tell you today, coming to the gift that Jesus offers you is the most important decision you'll ever make in all of your life. And then the second most important decision you'll ever make in all of your life is stewarding your life and inviting others to come. To come. Not in a way where you're beating people up, but you're truly inviting people with the Spirit of God, the Bride of Christ, using its gifts, its talents, its resources, its money, its attitude, everything, and inviting the world around us to come to Jesus. It's one of the most important things, believer, that you will ever do in all of your life. That is the mission of the church, is to partner with God and invite the world to come and meet this one who gives the free gift of life and his name is Jesus. And to not stop short of challenging the church to be all God has created them to be while they're in this body, okay, and and do everything they can to help, help accomplish God's mission throughout the world. Because you're going to be rewarded greatly for it, my friend. And God makes it crystal clear. And so a little bit kind of go a little bit deeper into this judgment. There's a man named Paul who wrote to the church at Corinth about about this particular reward ceremony. And I want to show you what he says, okay? And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We're going to talk about the rewards here in just a few moments. This is what it says. He says, for we know that when this earthly tent, he's referring to this skin, this body, we live in, it's taken down. He says, that is when we die and leave this earthly body. We will have a house in heaven, an eternal body, made for us by God himself and not not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies. Anybody weary today? He says, we grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. However, he's getting ready to say, but we don't choose to clock out early. In other words, I know I ache, I got some relational pain, I got some financial pressure, I got pressures in life, but we choose not to clock out early because we know what is yet to come. Okay, look what he says. For we will put on heavenly bodies, we will not be spirits 
float around without bodies. We talked about that last weekend. My friend, you are going to get a number 10 body <laughs> in eternity. The Bible says that God is going to give you a brand new body. And your spirit is going to be in that body. And it's going to be a functional body in a new heavens and a new earth for all eternity. Don't miss this. Many people say, I want to go to heaven. I do too. But remember that heaven and earth are going to collide and come together in a new heavens and a new earth at some point in time. So you may want to go to heaven, but remember, you're going to actually come back to earth. And the reason you're going to come back to earth is to function and be who God has created you to be and help him manage the universe, just like he had them to do in the garden. Real human beings. My friend, if you don't like your hair color today, well, Hopefully, it'll be a perfect hair color in all eternity. The best reference you have for what he means by a heavenly body, though it will have some applications and it will have some things extended about beyond this earthly body, but the best point of reference you got is what? The body you live in today. It is a, a functional body. And he says that you're not just going to be a spirit, but you're going to be a body. That was last week's message. Sorry to stay on it so long, okay? But it's really important. While we live... In these earthly bodies, he says in verse 4, we groan and sigh. Oh, my knee hurts. But, oh, she's mad at me. They said something about me. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on the new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this and as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit that this is coming. So by faith, you know what? God has given me his spirit, and I believe his word. And so, you know what? It is deposited in me as a believer. And, and, and so I'm going to live life like this is true. All right? And it goes on to say this. God himself has prepared us for this, and as a guarantee, he's given us the Holy Spirit. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. We're not finally there, okay? Four, we live by believing, not seeing. You're like, well, well show me a picture of my heavenly body. He's given you his word, and he's given you, you know what, everything you need to know. The question is, well, by faith, by faith, not seeing, but believing what God has said is going to be true. You say, well, I'm not really sure. What, what, I don't want to just blindly have faith. God's not asking you to blindly have faith. He is aligned completely all the way through history that he will do what he says he will do. And so you've got to keep in mind, you know what, and this is why a lot of people just can't believe in eternity because they haven't researched enough to know that God has aligned and done exactly what he says he will do up to this point. Okay? He's going to do what he says he will do. But what it says, yes, we are fully confident, Paul says, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we'll be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to what? To please God, to please Him. For we must all, all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have, we have done in this earthly body. He's a believer. He's a believer. He's in the kingdom. He knows he's going to have a new body, but he knows he's going to stand before Christ to be rewarded for all eternity. Look what he says. Because we understand our fearful responsibility, our incredible responsibility to the Lord, we work hard to what? To say, come. To say, come. To persuade others. It's your mission, church. He says, we work hard. Not to just, just kind of live life. We work hard to what? Persuade others. He says, for God knows we are sincere. And he says, and I hope, basically speaking to the church at Corinth, he says, I hope, I hope you know this too. 
What's amazing, he goes on to talk about how Jesus has reconciled us to God and has given us what they call the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Believer, I'm here to declare to you today, whatever gift God has given you, whatever he's placed in your hands, whatever relationships you have, whatever trials you have, those are all things from God for you to leverage, to help say, come, for you to partner with the local church, and partner with God's Spirit himself and invite other people to come. The only reason we're here in these earth suits as believers in Jesus Christ is to help other people come because the best is yet to come. And Paul says this, hey, I'd rather go there because I know it's true. However, you know what? I'm not going to clock out early because somebody is against me because I'm feeling some relational pain, because I know that, you know what, what is yet to come is determined by how I manage what I have now. Whether it's trials, whether it's tribulation, or whatever else. And it doesn't mean that you wouldn't get in, but what it does mean is you're not going to receive everything that God has in store for you. It's really important. And so many people say, well, the pain is just too heavy, and I need to leave now. No, you don't, my friend. No, you don't. The reward is too great there for you to walk away too early from your assignment. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm here to declare to you today, I do believe that Jesus is going to ask you a question. How did you do with my reconciliation project, believer? How did you do with my reconciliation projects with the gifts I gave you? Did you stand? Did you invest? Did you commit? Did you make did you make it about something else? The church is God's assigned vessel, and you're a part of it. To do what? Invite other people to come. And you know, it's a difficult thing sometimes because people resist what you say, people talk about you, people walk away from you. You know, and again. We're, there is no condemnation. There's no condemnation in this place. There's no condemnation in this church. But we invite all to come and be and challenge. Because there's a difference in challenging somebody and condemning somebody. Challenge somebody to step up and be who God has called them to be. And I believe a good shepherd, a good pastor, a good Jesus is always challenging you to be better. To become better. And I can tell you, so many people today in our culture has become so lazy, like, well, I'll just kind of get in and I'll be all right. No, 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 man. Let the coach of life, the God of the universe, speak to your heart today by the power of his spirit, my friend. Because you don't want to just get in. You want to receive all God had us in store for you. But we want to embrace this by faith. And what we cannot yet see, if we truly don't trust what God says. And so I am banking 100% on what God has said, okay? All my eggs are in that basket, 100%. It ain't like pick or choose. I believe that God says he is the way, the truth, and the life Jesus is. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And so I'm believing that, and I'm inviting you to believe that. I'm not trying to convince you to be a part of my religion. I'm not here to beat you up or anything else. But I am here to tell you what the truth of God's word says. And he says, would you please come? Would you come? Would you please come? And so Paul recognizes the judgment seat of Christ, all right? And so God is always challenging those early believers to not be overcomers, even though they were being persecuted for their belief in Jesus Christ. Okay, he's like, man, hold on to the faith because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Overcome. The best is yet to come. And if and and the Bible refers to us as overcomers. Okay, so many people put that in earthly context. No, no, no. You're an overcomer in all eternity. All right, and it's not just about here and now. This ain't microwave Christianity. This is about. Being an overcomer. Yes, God will bless you with with tangible things now, but his true blessing comes in all eternity. And so, you know, and and Jesus kind of gave 
Uh, another story, I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to talk about the rewards. I know I'm going over a lot of Scripture, but I'm really trying to make the point from the book of Revelation, the early church father Paul, and from our Lord Jesus himself. And so Jesus told a story to you and to me. And he says this. He tells a story about a king going away. It's found in Luke chapter 19. It begins in verse 11. The Bible says there was a crowd who was listening to everything Jesus said. He was an amazing teacher. And because he was nearing Jerusalem, basically for the time of his death, he told them a story to correct the impression that the kingdom of God would begin right then, right away, because that's what they thought, all right? He says this. He said a nobleman was called away to a distant empire to be crowned king and then return. That's who Jesus reveals himself as in Revelation chapter 1, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so he reveals, Jesus the revealer reveals to John, I am not a suffering servant any longer on a cross. I am a risen king, completely decked out. And I am the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I've gone to a distant empire. I've been crowned king, but I am going to return. Before he left, he called together. He says, 10 of his servants and divided among them 10 pounds of silver, saying, invest this while I am gone. Let that speak to your heart today. Invest this believer while he is gone. He says, but his people, his people hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, We do not want him to be our king. In other words, he's asking us to be a part of his kingdom. He's asking us to invest what we have. But there was a group of people that says, we don't want a king like that. You know, and what they did? They nailed him to a cross. Because they chose to go their own way instead of believing that the best was yet to come. The Bible goes on to say this. After he was crowned king, He returned and he called in the servants to whom he had given the money. He wanted to find out what their profits were. The first servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made ten times the original amount. Well done, the king exclaimed. You are a good servant. You have been faithful with the little I entrusted you. So you will govern, uh, you'll be the governor of 10 cities as your reward. You'll be basically uh, entrusted in all eternity with so much more responsibility because with the little you have, and my friend, may I say to you today, I don't care how much earthly resource you have, it is little compared to what you're going to get there. And he says, with the little you have, he says, I entrusted you with it, and did you choose to invest it for my mission and my sake to multiply, to be fruitful and multiply? That's the mission of the church, okay? To be fruitful and multiply, or did you just kind of let it sit on a shelf? He says that this was a good servant because he took it and he did something with it. He says, I'm going to entrust you with so much more authority, okay? He says that actually he goes on and he says, well done, and he's a good and faithful servant. The next servant reported, Master, I invested your money and made five times the original amount. Well done, the king said. You will be governor over five cities. Notice it says cities, all right? But the third servant brought back only the original amount of money and said, Master, I hid your money and kept it safe. I played it safe. I just kind of held on to my faith. You know, it's private. He says, I was afraid because you are a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't yours and harvesting crops you didn't plant. And the king was like, hmm, if that is your impression of who I am, and God would say this to you today too, that I'm a hard God with a big hairy beard, and I'm looking down on you, 
and I'm taking things that don't belong to me, and I'm working, working, working you, and I'm watching you, and I'm mad at you, and all that. If you believe that's who God is, that is a wrong impression of the God of the Bible. And so this man, he thought that, you know what, the king was, was mean, and he was afraid, and he was going to take what wasn't his, and he was afraid to even let go of something, because he thought, man, i got to give an account for all of this, and, and I'm scared to death. And the king's like, dude, I never entrusted you with your life for you just to sit on it. I entrusted you with your life to do something with it. You, you don't understand who I am. I'm not a God waiting for you to come and explain to me how good you are. I'm a God for you to understand how good I am and what I've entrusted you with. And are you going to be about my mission or about your selfish ambition? Look what it says. It goes on. This is an amazing story to me. He says, he says I was afraid because you're a hard man. You wicked servant, the king roared. Your own words condemn you. If you knew that I am a hard man who takes what isn't mine and harvests crops I didn't plant, that's your impression. Well, why didn't you at least deposit my money in the bank, okay? He says, at least I could have gotten some interest on it. And then turning to the others standing nearby, the king ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who has 10 pounds. But master, they said, he already has 10 pounds. This is all about equality. And he has more than everybody else. And the king says this. Yes, the king replied, and to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. He goes on to say, but from those who do nothing, who just attend who just hang out, who, who just are not about my mission, who, who just show up whenever it's convenient. Oh, he says, but to those who do not, he's not talking about this life, my friend. To those who do nothing, he says, even what little they have will be taken away. And for these who are enemies of mine who didn't want me to be their king, bring them them in and execute them right here in front of me. Jesus is referring to himself as he tells a story about a noble king who went away. He doesn't do that to frighten you. He does that to encourage you. And he's like, dude, by faith, would you believe that I am who I say I am? I have revealed myself as a risen king. Revelation chapter 1. I defeated death. The grave is empty. I am risen. I am God on high. He says to the church, to the people of God, to the seven churches of Asia, you're going to face difficulties. You're going to face challenges. You're going to face worldly desires. But you are an overcomer. Apply kingdom attributes. I'm going to come back. I'm going to deal with the enemy. And then... I'm going to set up a kingdom that will last forever and ever, a new heaven and a new earth, and I'm inviting you to be a part of it so that we can rule and reign the earth. He's calling you up, man. He is dialing your number. And he's inviting you to do something with your life. You're like, well, I'm tired and worn out. Well, he says that, you know what? Don't grow weary in doing good. Yeah. Hallelujah. Mm. Reward is too great, my friend, not to be about the ministry of reconciliation. Church, church, there's too much at stake in what is yet to come for you just to sit and watch. I'm inviting you today to think about all God has entrusted you your attitude, your relationships, your finances, your gifts, your talents, your jobs, your possessions, all, okay? I'm inviting you to consider it all. And what are you really about? Is it just to get to tomorrow morning? Jesus says, have faith. It's going way beyond that. And trust, he's entrusted you to do something great. And you, my friend, 
can trust that he is going to do something great. I'm going to hit the rewards really quick like today because of the sake of, of time. And we do something called Bright Nights on Wednesday night. I think, I don't know what I'm going to talk about this coming Wednesday night, but we do talk about the book of Revelation. And so I may end up talking about these rewards just a little bit more. I don't know. But anyway, if you want to come hear more about them, you can. But I'm going to give them to you real quick like script, scripture references. You can write them down. If you miss them, we archive the messages online. You can go back and check it out and pick them up later. Or you can Google them, okay? <laughs> All right. So I, that's amazing to me. People are waiting all the time for us to give them information. And I'm like, dude, there's been so much flipping information written that if you don't have the audacity to just look at it and try to comprehend it and take it to God's word, because people will say all kinds of stuff out of context, okay? But take it to God's word and apply God's word to your life. I invite you to search his word for the riches in it. It is amazing. Actually, I invite you to do that before you go to Google, okay? <laughs> and then you can go to Google, and it'll help authenticate a lot of what you understand from God's Word. The Bible says the Spirit of God comes inside of you, makes you alive, and even an old country boy from South Georgia, he begins to illuminate the Scripture in such a way that I can believe and trust, and you can too. It's amazing. So what was I going to do? I was going to talk about the rewards. Okay, so the rewards. Because you're like, dude, well, what am I going to get? Okay? <laughs> and some of us are sitting here because, you know, we, we, we've been raised in a context where we're like, well, we shouldn't desire rewards. No, no, no. Listen to me. God put it in his word for motivation believer. And Jesus, if you say we shouldn't seek the reward, I got to say to you today, Jesus said, he said, to, he said about his own self, he says, you know what, I am willing to walk through this suffering that the cross brings for the joy set before me. In other words, you know what, my motivation isn't to go to a cross and let somebody drive some nails through my hands, but my motivation is for the human race and also to do what I was assigned to do and come to do it. And there's joy on the other side of this set before me. I'm motivated to do it because I understand what's on the other side. Paul himself said this. Paul, Paul basically says, you know, I run this race to win. I'm going to read the verse in a minute. To win the prize. In other words, I give it all I got to win the prize. To win the prize. And it's not just salvation. No, he wants everything that God has in store for him. And the Bible does say the 24 elders take their crowns. But I must say to you today, it's not like a crown a king or, we, a, a king or queen wears with little diamonds in it. The Bible says they throw it down before Jesus' feet. And a lot of people are like, well, that's all I'm going to do with my crown. I don't want one. Yes, you're going to worship Jesus. He is the king of kings, but he is the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He has an assignment for you, and he did not just create you to sing songs in heaven for the rest of your life. He created you to rule and reign, my friend. But you'll never grab hold of this and be motivated by it if you continue to believe the enemy and you believe that you're not to be motivated by the God of the universe. Well, let the enemy keep you discouraged. But I'm here to declare to you today there's a lot at stake. And it's not just hanging out. It's a kingdom. We don't understand kingdom in our country because we live in a democracy. And you know, it's about, well, we just got to all vote and decide what is right for the human race. God has already voted, my friend. And he voted to send his one and only son to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is for you, not against you. He is setting up a kingdom that he is the king of. It's not a democracy. And so he says he's going to give you assignments there. So here they are. Let me get them to him real quick because I know some of you are motivated and want to know. He, he rewards us. I wrote it down this way. First of all, with words of affirmation. A lot of you have never been affirmed in all of your life. And, you know, I've discovered this on my journey as a pastor. There's a lot of people who have never had a, 
a father to affirm them. And so they have a, 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 a skewed vision of who God is because he is our heavenly father. But they have never had a father figure affirm them in their life. And they think, well, you know, i got to prove who I am in life. No, no, no. Understand something. The words of affirmation will come from your great God and your great king. If nobody ever tells you that you are worth anything in this life, you believe in what is yet to come. And I can tell you right now, some of the greatest words a, a, a human child can ever hear is, I love you. Yes, from their mother but also from their father. I love you, and I see more in you than you see in yourself. And I want to raise you to do great things, and I want you to know today, your heavenly father will affirm you. It says it there in Luke 19, it says that he says, the king will say, well done. Well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in what little I've entrusted you. And can I tell you something? I look so forward to my heavenly father affirming me, to my Jesus affirming me. Well done. Everybody is not going to hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Every believer is not going to hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Only those who managed what little they had, and was entrusted to do greater, greater things. The second one is this. So that's words of affirmation. You know, there is five love languages, right? What's that guy's name? Who? Chapman wrote it. Yeah, Chapman. It's a good book. It's awesome. It teaches you how to build relationships, how to love people like they want to be loved and all that kind of stuff. Well, Chapman didn't invent that. God did. So anyway, God does give words of affirmation. Here's the next one, tangible gifts. Anybody like tangible gifts? God's told you how to get them. You don't like tangible gifts? Anybody like tangible? I thought so, okay? All I got to do is look around, all right? So anyway, and, and so this is what Jesus said. I'm going to give you a quick hint. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Don't store up treasures how do you explain treasure? Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them. I think he's explaining what they are, okay? And rust destroys them. I think he's explaining what they are, okay? He says, and where thieves break in and steal my TV. <laughs> he's not saying do without a TV. He's not saying do without clothes. He's not saying walk instead of ride. He's just saying, what is your focus? And a lot of people would say, well, Jesus says don't have anything. I need to go move into a tent today. Don't miss this. Jesus says, steward what you do have. And I discovered this on my journey as a pastor. I used to think everything I got in my hands was to see someone in need and hand it to them. They need it more than I need it. That's what I used to think. And God revealed to me that is not good stewardship. I never placed a gift in your hand just to look around and see somebody that needed it worse than you and give it away. I've placed a gift in your hand so you can help people in need but point people towards Christ and be fruitful and multiply and steward that gift so that it can have greater impact for the kingdom. My friend, you can take the gifts and talents you have, and you know what? God could give you a $100 bill today, and you could take it and give it to somebody else that needed it worse than you. Jesus says there will always be people worse off than you. However, you know what? He says that we are to take care of people. But is it just one, or is it to be fruitful and multiply? Is it just to be humanitarian, or is it to be fruitful and multiply and help people understand about the kingdom of God and the true resurrection of Christ and what he can do in their life? I invite you to be a steward, my friend. I invite you to be a steward. And you know what? If God nudges your heart 
to do it and give it away, then give it away. But if he nudges your heart to steward it and multiply it, steward it and multiply it, okay? And hey, you have to discern that in your own heart. I can't discern that for you. I have to discern, you know what, what I do, and, 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 and I got to be accountable for what I do and how I steward what God's placed in my hands, and you do too, okay? And I'm not here to judge anybody. If God calls you to live in a tent and give it all away, that's, that, you do it. But God didn't call me to do that. God called me with a gift to be fruitful, multiply my gift, multiply my resources, use it to the fullest of its potential while I'm here on earth and make a difference. And, you know, yes, I give tangibly away. Let me answer that question for you today. All right? However, I'm, I'm, I'm very strategic in being a steward. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of people come to me and say, Pastor, you know, I don't want to bother you because I know you're busy. And I tell them all the time, my friends, I am not busy. Because that stands for being under Satan's joke. I'm not a busy person. But I will say to you, I'm very focused. Very focused. Very focused. And not only strategic about my resources, financially, not only strategic about what I have, but I'm very focused with my time. Because I know what God has given me and what I have to invest in to encourage many, okay? And so a lot of people will be like, hey, you know, well, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Because I'm focused. I'm stewarding. And, and that's simple, you know? And, and I'm just inviting you into the same game. I'm telling you a little bit about my own life. But, but a lot of people think, you know, that, that they're not supposed to, to uh, have any treasures or do anything. I'm teaching you about stewardship. But this is what he does say. Because he doesn't ever say, don't have anything. Actually, he says, store your treasures in heaven. Store your treasures in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. So there's an opportunity for you to store treasures in heaven, resources in all eternity. And, and Jesus makes it crystal clear. There's crowns, okay? And there's kingdom crowns. And I'm just going to hit them real quick like there's the crown of life. James chapter 1, verse 12. There's the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. The incorruptible crown, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. The crown of glory, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. And these crowns are not just jewels that sit on your head. These crowns are like they would give at a rewards banquet. The Greek word for it is stephanos, okay? It's not a diadem which sits on your head. There's two different Greek words for that. Jesus will have that, that, that kingly crown on his head. The crown he gives you is like a tangible reward at a rewards banquet, okay? Like at the athletes, whenever they would walk across and, and get the for winning, and doing something great, and it's tangible. But here's the deal. It's not to just get and give away. The Bible says it's going to be your crown for all eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. Maybe I'll talk about those crowns a little bit on Wednesday night. Here's the next one. Yes, there's two more, okay? He rewards us, okay? So he rewards us tangibly. He, re, re, he rewards, rewards us with words of affirmation, okay? He rewards us also with, with position, rank, and order. Position, rank, and order, okay? And that's found, again, I probably should have divided this into two messages, Kim. But anyway, that's found, you know, in that same passage of scriptures, Luke chapter chapter 19, okay? And it says that you'll govern basically 10 cities. Also, they were asking Jesus who will be the greatest in the kingdom in Matthew chapter 19. And he says there, he says, listen, he says, he says, I assure you, Jesus said, I assure you that when the world is made new, he is making all things new. And the son of man sits upon his glorious throne you who have been my followers will also sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's authority. 
okay? And he says this, and everyone who has given up houses, brothers, or sisters, or fathers, or mothers, or children, or property for my sake will receive a hundred times, for you mathematicians, that's a heck of an investment. He says a hundred times as much in return, and he will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then, and those who seem least important now will be the greatest then. Because the reason is, is because did they invest for my sake or did they invest because for their sake? It's interesting. It's interesting. And he says, you're going to govern cities. You're going to sit and you're going to be a servant and you're going to basically, he tells them that you're going to be over, over the tribes of Israel and it, the, the Bible refers to this new heavens and this new earth as, as a beautiful country and cities are involved. And what, what I want to say to you today is there is, is rank and order and position in the kingdom of God. And it even says, a lot of people say, well, man, you know, I love my family. I love my family too. I do. But it says here that, you know what, sometimes God calls you not to, not to be mean to your family, but God calls you for the work of the ministry and the mission that he's called you to, okay? And sometimes you, he says, if you choose my mission and my ministry over relationships, he says, you know what, I'm going to reward you for that. And he's not saying relationships aren't important because relationships are really important. But I'm here to tell you today, the church isn't a country club just so you can be liked better by other people. Your small group. It's not just to hang out with people so that they like you better. It all has a mission and a purpose. And so many people just want to hang out with people because they want to be liked. And God says, man, it's awesome to want to be liked. Everybody wants to be liked. I do too. But I can tell you right now is I am about the mission that God has given the local church on planet Earth. I don't want to alienate no one. I don't want to defriend no one, okay? Really ain't my heart, ever. However, if people choose not to walk and be about the mission, you know what? I have to learn to do something. Either I can choose to separate myself and keep being about God's business, or I can win a popularity contest. Which one do you want? And Jesus says, if you're willing to walk away, walk away for the mission, of what I've called you to do. He says, man, I'm going to reward you. Not here, but there for all eternity. Listen, I'm not here to judge anyone's heart. That's not my business. But I am here to evaluate myself and my walk with God and to be about his mission. And I invite you to do the same. Because so many people just kind of, you know, make it about this and make it about now. No, 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 no. That's not what it's about. Everything that we do as a church is about the mission. About the mission. Last thing is this, he rewards us with relationships. For us highly relational people, you know what? That's an awesome thing, okay? And because it says you're going to have many friends in heaven, but how are you going to have them? It's interesting how he says you're going to have them. He says it's based on how you manage those relationships here and help them get to heaven. And it says, he tells a story about it in Luke, actually, Luke chapter 16. He says, here's the lesson, because he talked about a shrewd manager who basically did something crooked. And you're like, Jesus, why are you telling about this guy who kind of tried to outdo his boss or whatever else? And the guy, and Jesus says, because he's very smart, because he built relationships that helped him on the other side of this job that he was fired from. And he says, you'd be, be wise to do the same thing. Look what he says. He says, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. And then... When your earthly possessions are gone, they, those people, will welcome you in eter into your eternal home. So how do you make friends with people? It, it's, it's about helping them get to heaven. It's about being about the mission. It's like partnering with the bride of, uh, partnering with, with the Spirit of God and being the bride of Christ and saying, come, come. It's fascinating to me how Jesus put that at the very end of the book. It says the Spirit and the bride both say, there's a whole message to do on that, okay? But also, it, you know, we're partakers of Christ, the Bible says. And being in Christ and a partaker of Christ are two different things. 
And Hebrews says this. It says in Hebrews 3.14, For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God, just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. All that belongs to Christ. Not just being in Christ and getting in heaven, but we're going to share. We're going to share in all that belongs to us, partakers of Christ. That, that means, you know what, some of us are going to be relationally closer to Christ in this final kingdom than others of us. It is simply amazing to me. And so many people miss this because we live in this democracy and we think about equality, but God says, I have a kingdom that I'm going to reward my servants in a powerful way. And, you know, so what I want to encourage you today, because you're getting ready to leave here, you're going to have a lot to think about. I'm going to encourage you today with the words of Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses, verses 24 through 26. And this is what he says. He says this, Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. He says, so here's the deal. Don't just run the race. He says, I run with purpose in every step, every waking hour, every day, every relationship, every transaction. He says, I run with a purpose. I didn't just run it haphazardly. What is the purpose? It's the mission of God. Look what he says. He says, man, I'm not boxing air. I'm not shadow boxing. He says, man, I'm the real deal. And he says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should otherwise. I fear that after preaching, he was a preacher, preacher of preachers, my friend. He says, after preaching to others, I myself may be disqualified. Not from heaven. Disqualified from the rewards that Jesus had for him. Man, I invite you today to run the race to win. Run the race to win. Think heavenly. Set your mind, Colossians chapter 3, on things above, not on earthly things. Manage, 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 manage. We all get it messed up. We do, but God has given us His Word, encouraged us, motivated us. And so, you know what? If somebody gives you a brand new guitar, learn to play the flipping thing and play it to the glory of God. Right, Barry? And if you can't play it, give it away for somebody that can. Gifts. It's amazing. And God has given us all these and gifts. You know, I'm on a journey just like you. My prayer is to take as many people to heaven with me as I possibly can. Help introduce people to the one who can save their life. His name is Jesus. And then, as I look across the vastness of people, faces, different ages, different genders, different ethnicities, to envision us together in heaven. And me had done all I could with the poor communication skills or whatever else I got to encourage you to be all God has created you to be. Because we're going to be there together for all eternity. Folks, this stuff is real. This is a it's the small church thousand, couple thousand people, whatever it is. However, heaven's a big place. And you know what? Week after week, month after month, people clock out. People clock out and they go into eternity. And man, my prayer is every time one of them leaves our congregation is, God, I hope they heard the good news. I hope they're in. And I pray that they have done the work of the ministry. And they've received all 
that was in store for them. I challenge you today, church. Let's pray, then we'll take up our offering, okay? God, you're an amazing God. You're faithful. And you've called us to be faithful stewards here on planet Earth. God, I pray, no matter how old anyone is, no matter how tired we are, we would not grow weary in doing what is good. You're an amazing God. And God, you have so much more in store for the human race. And God, you've given us every opportunity in the world to turn away from our sin, turn away from our missing the mark of your amazing, glorious standard by believing in Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Because he shed his blood on a cross to forgive us for everything. We don't have to try. We don't have to work. All we got to do is receive the gift. God, I pray today. There's a person here today who has never received that gift. That, God, today they would maybe talk to you. Not just talk to us, but talk to you. And go ahead and shore this thing up. And if that is you today, just simply say this right where you sit today. I'm not going to ask you to do a thing, but just say this prayer and confirm it with God today. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, in that moment God will salvage you for all eternity. Next weekend we're going to be doing public baptisms. You can profess it there. You can sign up for baptisms today when you leave. But if today is the day of your salvation, you know what? I need you to profess that publicly next weekend through a public baptism. But if you're ready to make Jesus the king of your life, put your faith, your trust, your belief in him today so you can be in his eternal kingdom, just say something like this. God, I'm tired of doing life my own way. And today, I turn. I turn away from doing that. And God, I trust that your plan for greatness in my life is the best plan. I trust the, the, the forgiveness that Jesus offered me on the cross. It's full forgiveness for every wrong, every missing the mark of your amazing standard in my life. God, I receive that gift today. God, I want to open that gift. I want to use it to the fullest of its potential. God, I want to receive the great reward that you offer me. You're an amazing God. And I want to serve you diligently. I want to partner with your church and with your spirit for all eternity to help other people come to Jesus. Just simply tell God that we've got environments for you to step in. And God, you know what? You hear these prayers today. God, they're confessing with their mouth. God, I pray that they would make that declaration public through public baptism next week. And God, they would sign up today to do that because baptism is a way to show that we have died to ourselves and been raised to new life in Christ Jesus going to be doing that next week. If you said that prayer today, man, take that step. It's a step of following Jesus as your king. God, we thank you for all these prayers today. We pray that we would be good stewards with all we have. In Jesus' name, amen.